everyone. Hello, hello. Welcome hello. to another book club interview. Um, yes, so we recently read Gothgull Hollow by the amazing Anna Stevens, and, and she's here with us today, right here. Hi, Anna. Hello. Thank you so much for inviting me on. I'm very excited. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Yes, we are. We well, we've. It's also. It's like semi. It's. It's kind of still almost spooky season. We didn't mean to read this book for spooky season, but it sort of ended up that way. I mean, I think it's good to read at any time of year, but there is something. There is something good, I think, about reading um, books that have a plethora of skeletons in them um, yeah. around around skelly season. So there, yeah, there are an awful lot of skeletons in this book. So one of the things we commented on was how many random statues of skeletons there are and how they got. Yeah, them. yeah, um, that was actually that was actually my editor. Um, so I sent the first draft in, and she came back and she was like, "Can you do more skulls?" And I was like. <laughs> Never been, I've never been asked this before in my professional career, but yes. You've written a lot before. Very right? much more skulls. <laughs> um, so yeah. So yeah. That, that I've never I've never been asked for that before. But um yeah, it was uh it kind of set the tone then for for the rest of the collaboration on the book, which I thought was fun. Um I should probably say to start with, I mean, I'm assuming most of the people who will be listening to or watching this would have um seen the last video, but um we really, really enjoyed the book. Uh, as Mira was saying, it's a bit of a breath of fresh air after all the heresy and gaunt's ghost books. Mm -hmm. Um uh, how would you describe what's what's the pitch? How would you describe Gothgill Hollow? Um, I mean, it sounds a bit of a cop out, but I really like what they said, what they said on the back, scholar, sorcerer, killer, priest. I just, I thought it, it summed it up really nicely. Um, and it is, it is the story very much of four completely different people who are forced together by, by love, but also by circumstance to confront like probably the deepest fears of all of them at various different points. I don't think that's quite a pitch, but <laughs> that's how I would describe it. But but it's an interesting thing because it's 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 the first Warhammer horror is quite a new thing. Um, yeah, uh, and it's the first Warhammer horror book we've written with a bit of trepidation, right, Mira? Because neither of us are horror people. No, I'm famously like very gore averse. And, you know, often tell Ian off for making me read, you know, one space marine stabbing too often, you know. <laughs> but I can't, we kind of both had a really pleasant surprise because we kind of drifted into this, you know, gothic romance, family, you know, magic, you know, it was, it was a completely different experience. So, yeah. And I was wondering, you know, we were talking about it's so atmospheric mm -hmm. and I know you, you write a lot. Please don't tell me you were writing this with blazing summer and and please tell me you were in a little cottage on a moor somewhere <laughs> and there was howling in the night. Like how did you get in the frame of mind and and you know to get into this? Yeah. Um I wish I could say that I was on the moors when when I wrote it, but unfortunately, um I was not. I was in this very room. Oh, the room. Um, <laughs> this is it. This is this is the writing cave. Um, the writing, the writing poodle is just behind me. Oh yay! Um, <laughs> so, so he accounted for most of the howling. It has to be said. <laughs> the beast in the but, background, but in a much less terrifying manner. Um, <laughs> you must have. I'm sure there are ghosts inhabiting that room now that you've invoked. <laughs> and um, I was so interested because you've written a few different things, but how did you trip into the Black Library? Do you play Warhammer? Like, what's your relation to this world? Um, I actually do not. And I know that at least 50% of your audience are now going to hang up. Um, and that's, <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Um, so I do play um, tabletops. Uh, mostly, I, I am mostly a D&D &D person, a um, couple of home brews, stuff like that. This wasn't, so Warhammer wasn't something, I knew of it, obviously, because everybody does. Yeah. Um, there is a shop in my local town, a, you know, a Warhammer mm -hmm. shop in my local town. But um, one of the editors at Black Library actually reached out to me uh, because of my first trilogy, my um my first traditional published, not Warhammer trilogy, uh, the Go the Goblin trilogy, and he'd read that and he said, um, 
we think you would be a good fit for Black Library and do you want to pitch something to us? Yes, I need to do some research, but yes, definitely. <laughs> and he said, fear not, I can send you a couple of PDFs. Um, and both of the PDFs were so massive that they broke my computer. Um, <laughs> he was just like, here, have 44 million years of uh, law. And I was like, Welcome to my you. world. Yeah. Someone else who has to do this. Yeah. Um, so I basically spent like a few weeks just go. So I had the I had the 40K um, law and I had the Age of Sigma law and I had to basically just pick one. And I was like, because I write fantasy, Age of Sigma spoke to me more than 40K at that point. So I thought, right, okay, so that's the one that I want to focus on. So I pitched a different couple of story ideas to him and um, and he was like, yeah, that's good. And, and so I had a couple of stories come out and then um, Hannah Hughes, who's an editor at, um, at Black Library, she wanted me to do some more. She got in touch and she wanted me to do some more long form stuff. So uh, so I did my first novella, uh, which is Trisethne the Unseen, uh, which is in the Covens of Blood um portmanteau novel which was a huge amount of fun because it was my first sort of introduction to the daughters of Cain and I was like these girls are messed up which was like and it was a load of fun but I was like how the hell do you write a story about someone who is so unapologetically evil and make it interesting and make her sympathetic Um, the permanent so, Warhammer problem. Yeah. <laughs> Almost so, easier in Age of Sigmar because everyone in 40K is horrible. Yeah. So so from a craft perspective, it was really interesting. It, it was like I learned a hell of a lot writing that novella um, purely because I was like, well, she doesn't regret what she's done. She's never going to regret it. She absolutely believes in, uh, you know, all of this stuff. And I've still somehow got to make readers like her. And it was, um, so that was a real challenge. Um, And then from there, my editor was like, do you want to do a novel? And I was like, yeah, okay. And she was like, so we've got this idea. We're thinking about introducing a horror imprint. And I was like, okay, I don't write horror. And she was like, well, no, but you write some pretty dark stuff. And I was like, well, yeah, okay, but that's not, that's, that's just dark fantasy. That's not necessarily horror. They are two different genres. And we went back and forth quite a lot. um, And they sort of said, this is what we're thinking for the first book. Do you want to write it? This is um, what needs to happen at the end. Do you want to be responsible for that? And I was like, no. (laughs) Yes, yeah, we, need, we need to talk further about that ending. Don't let that go, Ian. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, and so from there, it was just it was it was quite collaborative because you know, I mean, Warhammer they do have quite a distinct vision for where they want their fiction to go and how they want it to tie in with the game and and, and all the rest of it. So yeah, so it was very much a back and forth, and 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 my editor would say, well, why don't why don't you do this? And I'd be like. I like it, but I'm going to counter offer with this because it's a little bit more traumatic or it's a little bit more atmospheric. And um, eventually we sort of, we came to an outline between the two of us. And then from there, it was just, you know, just, just go, just go away and write it. And, and it was, it was so much fun to have that collaborative process that it made it a real joy to write because I knew that they were already on board with, with the end product that I was going to produce. Uh, which does quite take the pressure off, it has to be said. Yeah, you've got actual feedback consistently all the way through to yeah. Sure. yeah. It's it's really nice as well. One of the things that was really obvious is coming from somewhere outside war outside Warhammer, there's a load of things in this that are really refreshing because you don't see them a lot in Warhammer novels. And partly it's the setting and the, the sort of one of my questions I want to ask you about that, how you choose the level of horror. But there's some there's some romance, there's yep. a load of family drama. There's, a, yep. there's loads of things you just don't really get in Warhammer novels very often, which is really refreshing. Yeah, I mean, the so what my editor said was, yes, it's a Warhammer novel. Yes, it's set in Shayish with all of the weirdnesses that happen in Shayish. Um, and they were like, but the emphasis is this is a gothic horror. And that's that's that that's how we want you to approach it. So you need to the setting needs to be explicitly Shayish. Um, and all of that business still needs to be happening, but over and above that, this needs to be a gothic horror novel. 
um, which was absolutely, you know, brilliant for me because I'm, you know, I'm a huge fan of Frankenstein and mm. and um, Dracula, and but I'm also a massive Hammer horror fan of the films from the 60s and 70s. So it was very much a case of right. So basically, what you're telling me is that Eric Gothel is um, Christopher Lee, <laughs> and <laughs> and Tiberius is. Peter Cushing, obviously. <laughs> and then as soon as I had that in my head, I was like, oh, yeah. Da, 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 da. And then I just started writing and, and it all just sort of came from there. Aww. Someone did mention in the comments, because we we missed it, because I've not watched a lot of Hammer Horror. Um, yeah. And my, 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 my things were like, ob- obviously, uh, Ed Dreher is Eva Green in about 2005 in any anything. In um, anything, yeah. uh, but specifically in Pinky Dreadful, yes. Which mixed with Rachel Weisz and The Mummy. Um, but yeah, yes. someone did mention the Hammer Horror references. I did not pick up on, but yeah. Sorry, shall, we, yeah. shall we tell um, shall we tell Anna the other references we came up with? Yeah, what's for spotting references? I think some of them are obvious, like what must have been obvious, but but uh, yeah, go for it. So one that I was thinking, it really reminded me of Rebecca. You know. Uh, Daphne de Maurier, yeah. yeah. Um, not consciously, no. Okay, that's fine. Just comparing you to a literary great, so that's no, all good. I mean, obviously, compare me to Daphne du Maurier at every possible instance. Um, but I didn't I mean, consciously no. uh, but, um, have yeah. Rebecca in mind. Yeah, I was like, but last night... Uh, Damn, last, I night said that. <laughs> last night, I dreamed of Gothel Hollow, and then 100% Hound of the Baskervilles. We were both like, oh, you know, yeah. that scary beast yeah. lurching across the moors, and then... You know, a bit of Kate, Kate Bush, Bronte. you know. A bit of anything Bronte in there. Yeah. 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 I will, I will acknowledge that one. I mean, one of the things I absolutely loved was it felt so uh, not like folk, like I suppose very, you know, English legendary kind of felt really planted in the moors. And a lot of Age of Sigma, as I'm learning, is very German or continental. This mm. felt so old school, like little village, even with the kind of feudal, that you know, the, the Lord of the Manor must protect the peasants. And Ian was yeah. noticing in the audio book, all the peasants are like, oh, there is a beast out there. <laughs> <laughs> and then everyone, you know, all the, all the heroes are, you know, terribly posh. Yes. Um, yeah. But yeah. I just was just fangirling over that atmosphere. And I think I may be reading the wrong things and also Gothic, those Gothic mysteries feel quite 80s and 90s. So I love that revival and that kind of very British remote village on the moors thing. Did you have any direction around like location or were you allowed to interpret Shayesh as you wished? Um, not entirely as I wished. There was there were very much, you know, so it was like, okay, so we've got like the amethyst sky and the purple grass and there's lots of gorse around and, and you know, you're kind of hanging out with your granny who's been dead for 50 years, but she still comes to tea kind of, you know, kind of thing. Although obviously in this setting, because of, uh, because of the Murgas curse, the, the dead are not as happy to see you as they once were. Um, and then, you know, they might, they might, they might invite you in for tea or they might rip your head off. You know, it's, it's a bit of a toss up. So, um, which is why there's, there's the bit where, um, they have to quiet the graves and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, which was a bit of a departure from traditional Shayish, but that is because of the Murgas curse, but for like the makeup of the castle and the moors and stuff and the, and the town of Gothel Hollow and all that. My editor actually went on holiday. It was, it was hilarious. She went on holiday, um, to somewhere in like Yorkshire or Lancashire. Mm. And she oh. went on a hike and she found this little sort of stone tour, like on the oh, moors, oh. and she took a picture of it and she emailed it me and she was like, It's the blood rock beast. <laughs> and I was like, Oh my god, that is visually, that is almost perfect. <laughs> oh. um, so it was it was just such a strange sort of occurrence that happened. Yeah. Um, but I mean, other than that, you know, it it's it's literally just any time I've I've driven through the Lake District, basically, and I've been like, "My God, that's atmospheric!" You know, yeah. you look out the window. <laughs> and can I ask you about the purple thing? I loved it. I thought the, the the way you artfully, you know, spun in the lilac, the amethyst, the purple. It was it just was so beautiful and harmonic, and helped with all the descriptions. 
So, and also when when our, our heroine's casting magic, that's purple. So mm. Ian was explaining a little bit about the different colours of magic and... So, yeah, and I mean, how many Warhammer books get to look this pretty as well? I know, straight so, edges on a Warhammer novel. Yeah. yeah. So Who am I, royalty? You are royalty, Anna. That's <laughs> it now. Um, so I was wondering, like, what, you know, was that an absolute dream to get to do that, to go heavy on the the, the colours? And what was what was all that about? In, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, so that was that was one of the one of the pieces of direction that I got was that um, Shayish is known for having like a purple sky and mm-hmm. like the, the, the lots of you know like the, the amethyst grass and stuff like that. So obviously, because I wanted to ground ground it in the place, I wanted to reference that sort of on mm-hmm. the regular, just just for you know people. For people who know the mortal realms really yeah. well, I wanted to keep you like, look, yes, this is a gothic horror, but look, we are in Shayit. And then for people who just read it because it was a horror novel mm. and they don't really know much about Warhammer, I wanted to sort of introduce them to those elements of the mortal realms. Um, so, th- and that was why I chose to to sort of talk about the the color purple and and mm. stuff like that quite a lot throughout. Um, and also, it's just Gothic as fuck. Yeah, I'm sorry, but there is. purples and uh, you know, it it just it just screams gothic to me. It I don't know why, but really yeah. accessible as well. Like we've, I know a little of Age of Sigmar. I know more about the old world. Um, I know nothing. We started this not realizing it was there was anything before. I thought it was a standalone. So yeah, it, it sort of is. And and but also I think like that initial setting of like. Um, almost Victorian Gothic horror, Hound of the Baskervilles, English Moors, that sort of thing is a kind of an, an, a nice way into the world. It, it simultaneously it's a nice way into the world mm-hmm. if you've never experienced it, especially compared to like starting off with the Stormcast Eternals and the Castle of Sigmar. And you know, that's that's very like deep. Whoa, okay, we're really in Age of Sigmar, are we? Yeah, um, yeah. And also it does this lovely thing of I don't know how much in novel form Shayish was ever really featured that much before mm. so so the idea that like it, it's really nice to see just like people living in you know what do people yeah. actually live like in in somewhere where the god is just nagash and that's normal yeah i mean <laughs> like you know it's like would you not leave if you possibly could yeah. you know i mean <laughs> he's a bit mad but okay <laughs> there's a beast wandering around the next village over is looking lovely yeah exactly exactly we're gonna go to that nice warm realm of fire that looks lovely yeah, we'll go yeah, yeah. <laughs> just go there for the winter you know yeah. warm up a bit it's the inevitable, if Age of Sigmar keeps progressing and they keep unifying and doing winning all these Realm Gate Wars, the inevitable regression of that is tourism, right? Yeah. We'll have like holiday but adventure books. People will be like, there'll be, there'll be Death on the Nile, but the Warhammer version. There'll be all It'll these be, um, things. There'll be Shayish, but no one's actually dead on the Nile. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's undead on the Nile. Death on the Nile. <laughs> it, will be, um, it will be like, there'll be like Ankh Morpork's popping up everywhere yeah. where there's just. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> A comedy cast of characters. Can we talk about? I re, I, know, I know we might not be ending. Can we, we talk about the talk end? Talk about the end, shouldn't we? Okay. So I don't know a lot about Warhammer and 40k, but even I'm on the kind of peripherals. I'm trying to get in, and I even I know who Genevieve is. Uh-huh. I just know that Genevieve is a super famous, you know, vampire with loads of books about them. Um, what the fuck? Like. <laughs> Because, because we we both that was, that this was my was, face. That was my we face. Like, oh, how does this? And, and it's like, and the, and that vampire yeah. was Genevieve. <laughs> and then I was like, Ian. I remember we were texting like. Oh. <laughs> so yeah. Um. So what's going to happen next? Like, is this a prequel? How come Genevieve's a baby? Is it the cutest vampire ever written? But like, like suckling, love me, love me, mummy. I was just so vampire. happy. Can you tell us all the things about? Yeah. <laughs> how, did, how did this happen? How did you get into a situation where, yeah, you mentioned that they, they had an idea for the ending. I knew what they wanted to do right. with the end of the book. Yes. Um, it was very much like in the early stages of the negotiation as to whether I wanted to write it and they wanted me to write it. Mm. It was a case of, you know, um, 
it's it you don't just have free reign mm-hmm. to write what you like to do what you like with the characters there is a very definite end game this needs to happen um are you comfortable writing within those restrictions mm. you know i was like you're trusting me with this are you 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 really want to do this you want me <laughs> to do this and i mean come on who could say no yeah. Literally, who could say no? It's like, I mean, how long has she been gone? Oh, just, you know, just a few millennia. Right? <laughs> Where has she been? In hell. Okay. Oh, like 30 years. How happy that? is she when she comes back? Not very. <laughs> <laughs> and so for then, for the structure to be, you know, each part and each uh, supernatural presence to to be her desperately trying to get back through and everything she does sort of manipulating particularly Adria to this single point where she can come back mm. um it was such an intriguing concept but also the fact that she appeared in all of these different guises and it was just like Okay, you get to write The Exorcist. You get to write The Hound of Baskervilles. You get to write A Haunting. I forgot that one, The Exorcist, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? So, um, although, I mean, I say it's kind of like The Exorcist crossed with um, The Yellow Wallpaper, like that, the the, the short story. Do, do you know the, the short story called oh. The Yellow Wallpaper? It's... Um, it's it's very very old. It's like a nineteenth century, I think. It, it's it's kind of it, it's basically it's a story of uh, I think she's a new bride, and she goes to a, her new husband's house, and he's like, "Well, this is your room, and it's got this yellow wallpaper on, and it's got this sort of really intriguing pattern." And she can never quite find the end of the pattern. And it's basically it's a story of like a mental breakdown, and and she just oh, no. she starts following the wallpaper she follows like one strand of the pattern and she sort of walks around the room and but she just keeps on going and it gets to the point where she wears a groove in the wallpaper with her shoulder as she's just and she just doesn't stop and it was that sort of obsession and compulsion that I wanted um for Hefzibar mm. yeah. That, you know, she can't stop. And even though she's pregnant and and Eric's like, okay, you're going to harm the baby. And she's like, don't tell me what I can do. And Mm. don't limit me just because I'm pregnant, which was a thing that I really wanted to get in there. You know, don't don't make me all about the fact I'm pregnant. I'm still a person. I'm still an incredibly powerful sorceress. But at the same time, she can't see that her own compulsion was spiraling out, spiraling out of control. One of the things you mentioned, Mirren, in the previous one, that, that how many novels have a mid-birth demon fight? Oh, my God. It was so powerful. It was like, I have read a lot of fucked up shit in Warhammer, <laughs> and there are a lot of horrible, scary space marines doing horrible, scary things. But I was like, a woman, like, giving birth, going, directing people, do this, do that. You know, I've got to take care of everything and have a baby and kill the monster. Um, it was so intense. I was thinking... One of my questions to you is, were you exhausted when you finished writing this book? But that was so profound. It was so intense. I think that was one of the most intense moments in the book. So did you take that from life comparisons? Oh, no, I do not have children. I do not have children. (laughs) Um, um, It was just, uh, so we we kind of knew that the, the possession needed to come to a head as she was giving birth. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so that the you know the, you know has the baby been touched, or is it just that she takes Hefzibar? Um, and I, I I did find it quite difficult to write, which is why, <laughs> which is why when you you come out of the flashback and and you've got yeah. poor old Runar and he's like, <laughs> got a really awkward question, but what <laughs> happened? Like the umbilical cord, and I was like, how do I? And I was like, I'm just writing it. I, it's yeah. just. It, it's gothic. It's, it's it's pretty disgusting. It, it kind of goes in the Age of Sigma universe sort of thing. But I did sort of have a little bit of a chuckle to myself that out of all four of them, it was him who was like willing to ask the question about yeah. who were, were, was she not connected to the baby at the time? So yeah. I mean, I love Runar. Thank you so much for the gift that is Runar. <laughs> so noble. <laughs> 
just standing around in a bedroom being completely proprietary, you know, I don't know what the word is, very gentlemanly. I was like, oh, yeah, so old fashioned. You know, there was lots of yearning. We liked the yearning, didn't we, Ian? Yeah, there was a lot of, there was some good breathless yearning, uh, you know, a couple of times there. Lovely. Runa, Runa also, there's like, there's a lovely thing about the two younger characters are the ones with their heads screwed on. Yeah. <laughs> going, uh, yeah. hold on a minute. That doesn't sound good. We, should you be doing that? Is this yeah. really a good idea? While while the, yeah. the dad and the dad and Tiberius are both like flapping, basically. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, it was quite funny because um, I remember when Mike Brooks was reading it, <laughs> and he did actually send me a text at one point, and he was like, "Hold on a second, are they about to get it on on the necromancy table?" And I was like, "Yes." <laughs> I leave that to your imagination. <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. You know, well, <laughs> so you put it right on the page, so it's going to have to be in your imagination. Oh no, oh, I love. Oh no, we got so close to one of the few times sex has been in a Warhammer novel. Mm. Nice sex, nice. Not you know, everyone's been inspired by the warp to have an orgy with crab claw sex. Yeah, no, no, yeah, no, like normal, yeah, not crab, not crab claw walk. Not sex. crab claw sex. No. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a lesson for life, really. It's just <laughs> not crab claw sex. Come on. I think it's so. Too. It's interesting as we talk about it, like one of the things we went in going was like this, it, we were we were relieved that we it was going down the sort of romantic gothic horror route rather than like we were about to read the Warhammer version of it. <laughs> but actually... The more you go through what actually happens in this book, it is pretty full on. <laughs> yeah. I reckon a bunch of people will have gone to Waterstones, maybe women of a certain age like myself, and they will have been completely tricked into reading Warhammer. And this will be much more visceral than they were expecting. <laughs> you should check it out on Goodreads and see if anyone, I was expecting. A, a, but yeah, I think you might have really, you know, wooed those people in. Yeah, yeah. you know, maybe I've I've hit the, you know, if I could have hit the uh, the romance uh, niche, you know, <laughs> you you like your Regency romances. How about a, a, a kind of, you know, a bit of a Victorian romance with a twist? <laughs> Warhammer romance, <laughs> inevitable next imprint. I think they would make a ton of money. <laughs> Really we, 100% let's make that happen <laughs> like live if you're listening but you can't just say with a twist there are about 80,000 twists <laughs> I mean I would compare this to the usual suspect I was like <laughs> what is happening there was secret doors there was like a flashback with a big lie family lie it was like you were thinking that the person at the beginning was going to be all right and get away he was immediately slashed <laughs> as in all horror films I mean, it was so twisted. My head did do a full exorcism. I was like, <laughs> that was, how, do, how do you keep up that momentum? And you must have had to plan meticulously and then figure out how not to reveal. Is it like baking a very complicated cake? Or how do you do that? <laughs> how? Sorry, I always, I always get really uh, insanely obsessed about how the author does it, the technique. You share your secrets. I, I really wish I had a very clever answer. Um, <laughs> a lot of it, a lot of it, it sounds bizarre, but a lot of it is I'll be like, I don't know how I'm going to resolve this, but I'll keep writing. And then 30,000 <laughs> words later, I'm like, my, my subconscious has gone, this is how you solve it. And I'm like, oh, thank God for that, because we were actually getting to that point. Um <laughs> So I don't know how I get there for for some of these things. Um, others, as I said, because it was quite a collaborative process to to create the outline. So I did know I did know some bits that needed to happen, but I wasn't entirely sure how we were going to get there. So things like um, the importance of the locket and mm. the fact that she, you know, Edria's like. I mean, it, I just really crap myself up when she, it's like it's the middle of the night and she's dragging the ladders across the ballroom floor. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck is that noise? Oh, my God, we're being attacked. No, it's just me with the ladder. Sorry. <laughs> um, but then, you know, she's like, she's up on the painting and she's like, why have I never noticed that before? And it, that I sort of like, I really enjoyed because it's like when you do live in, you know, if you live in a big house or or you know, it's like you think about your childhood home and you're like, you can picture it completely, but you don't necessarily, if you went back there, you'd be like, oh my God, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was that same sort of thing. So I, I wanted to have 
that idea of something that's always been there, but actually she's just never noticed it before. Yeah. Um, Which all adds, slightly adds to the spookiness of the whole setting anyway. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, I, I wanted to leave it a tiny bit ambiguous as, you know, well, was it always there? It, has it been somehow hidden from her all this time? Mm-hmm. And it's taken her not just growing up, but growing in power for her to, you know, yeah. to finally pierce this tiny little illusory veil that was over the thing that was going to give her the secrets, you know. I like I like that aspect because you, you play, you like... D and D, right? So, yeah. As she was learning the magic, she got more books. She was leveling up, and at yeah, the end, I mean, she was like, blowing herself across the room on the regular. But yeah. you know, yeah. But well, you know, maybe she was a wild magic sorcerer. You know, that would have been her yeah. character. Yeah. Great thing we were saying from the back of the back of the book when it's like um, uh, sage sorcerer adventure, and you're like, yeah, that's that's all Adria. That's all Adria. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, there is always that. There is also that. One thing that I was quite keen that I wanted to do was I didn't want to make her particularly likable. Mm. And I was like, it's a bit of like, I'm not really sure how readers are going to react to it. You know, some readers might be like, oh my God, does she ever stop whinging? <laughs> but, that, but it was so much more than that. You know, it was, she had been stifled and constrained and isolated and, and basically held captive all her life because of her father's grief mm. and his complete refusal to accept that she could handle herself. Mm. And I didn't want your typical, you know, father-daughter team up we're both incredibly competent and we love and respect each other kind of thing I didn't want that dynamic at all I wanted her to be just churning with resentment at everything at his you know the fact that he wouldn't let her do anything at the fact that every time she exhibited a tiny flash of independence Uncle Tiberius arrives Mm -hmm. and he's like well have you thought about maybe just not and and, (laughs) you know she's she she loves them both and she has a huge amount of respect for them, but they're both so broken by her mother's death that they won't let her live. Mm. And I, I wanted that to be like a real driving force for her. So, um, so for me, like probably the greatest climax of the book wasn't necessarily the ending, although the ending, Oh my God. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was when Arik was like, yeah, go for it, kick yeah, ass. Yeah. Do your thing. When he because it was his like his ultimate realization that um he'd kept her captive all this time. But actually, if they were gonna live, he had to set her free, despite the fact that he might lose her. Mm. And so for me, it was that that sort of moment, that kind of shared glance across the room when he's like, Yeah, do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The approval that she told herself she didn't want yes. and she didn't need. But then when she gets it, it's it's yeah. everything. I think mm. all of that, that relate the relationships between them are all beautifully realized like that. There's so many nice, lovely little moments of like also her the way the way her and Runar work is really nice. The different like different sort of competencies that are sort of yeah. who's who's willing to admit that the other one might actually have a point is is quite <laughs> quite nicely done. Yeah. Yeah, but I also I I really I really liked writing him as I'm just your backup. You yeah. are so much stronger than me. Yeah. I'm just the guy with the bullets. You go do your thing and I'll do my best to help. Yeah. yeah. And there was no, you know, there was no ego around that. Yeah. And I wanted that to be, you know, to be come across really clearly that, you know, he's he's been through some terrible background, some, some some awful backstories himself. You know, he's he loses people right at the very start of the mm. book. Mm. Um, and he's like, right, so I can try and take control and be a hero. Or actually, I'm like a priest of Sigma, a scholar who fought in the, like, who is a, a living legend, mm. and a woman who can turn me inside out with a snap of her fingers. I'm, I'm <laughs> going to do what I'm told, and yeah. I'm going to be happy about it. Yeah. I thought... It was great. It was very, um, you know, it was like, so, and I don't know if this is the right word. I'm going to try and use it. Antithetical to Warhammer in that so many of the phallic guns mm. were 
useless. Yeah. Yes. Every time a gun got pulled out, it was destroyed. And I just thought that was so anarchic in the Warhammer universe. I'm <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. And um, yeah, and I mean, I, I talking about um the power and like you know the struggle. So in one of the fights, the beast gets a, a finger cut off, a paw, mm. and led me to ask, will this incarnation of Genevieve only have like nine fingers? <laughs> mm. Do we know? We Do you check. know? It's an interesting one, the Genevieve connection, isn't it? Because it was, if I'm right, it was a trilogy of short stories in the Warhammer universe. And so it's it's Jack Yeovil originally, which was Kim Newman, who then, um, but then who took it and put the character in other novels that he wrote. Yeah. It was in Anno Dracula, I think, which isn't a Warhammer thing at all. So like, was there any, do you, did you have to bear any of that in mind? Is that, I, I was like interested in like, did someone have to go and check that, Kim Newman hasn't taken, didn't take the character in some direction in 1996. Or, uh... <laughs> um, I think the, I think that the, the prevailing idea was that we take, we take the Genevieve from the Warhammer books. Yeah. Um, if she kind of went off in a tangent in, in someone else's IP, then not Catnan, but we're not, you know, we're not yeah. sort of, yeah, not Canon. We're not paying attention to that. Yes. Um, so I read, um, I read Drakenfels and Silver Nails, and that was as far as I got because I didn't want to be influenced too much. Mm -hmm. Not because I didn't want to, you know, recreate the same character, but um, because she has just spent like five thousand years millennia yeah. um, mm -hmm. in in a chaos hell and you know she's not exactly in her right mind when she comes back no um so really how much of her past personality is even relevant mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting especially towards the end you know because it, it she does only appear for like a very few pages so it's not like she kind of gets mm. over all the madness and all the trauma that she suffered and is just back to being her, you know, her suave, sophisticated self. She, you know, the, the book does end very much with her still being extremely ragged and driven mostly by absolute incandescent rage and a desire mm -hmm. for vengeance. You know, she's not thinking rationally. She's like, okay, hey, do you want to come with me and destroy the fucking world? Because <laughs> here I'm going. <laughs> and, the, and she's not, you know... She's not particularly persuasive, although in a way she is. But, you know, she's not setting out to to subtly manipulate people the mm -hmm. way she did in her, possibly in her incarnation as as the ghost with, with Hefzibar. That that idea that the Age of Sigmar sort of reincarnates characters and they're all slightly different and slightly more, a bit more ephemeral and a bit more... Um, a bit different from what they were in Warhammer is, is, is something that has happened a few... You know, that's... All, all the gods of Age of Sigmar are, used to be characters who were all slightly different to that. And yeah, that. yeah. I mean, you know, we can think of a certain um, Time Lord from Gallifrey who, hey. who yeah. did a very similar, very similar thing. You know, he's worked with him them for sixty years. So yeah. why not? We probably, probably Which, should say that. What, what's next for you and you and Genevieve, if if anything? <laughs> So you you know okay. that there are two sequels to Gothgore Hollow already, yeah? Uh, there is a plan for a fourth story. Um, I'm not sure where it is in negotiation stage. I'm trying. I, I can't really say more. No. Than that. Yeah, and we wouldn't we wouldn't want to make you tell us any secrets, would we? I would say it's a very safe bet that Genevieve is going to star quite predominantly in that fourth story. And, and will you because be you can't bring her back and then not? And will 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 you, Anna, be returning to the Warhammer world anytime soon? Um, I hope so. Yeah, I um, I've been in negotiations back during the summer on something, and I know that they want me. Um, they would like me to write a couple of different things, um, but again, we haven't signed anything yet, so I can't oh. really tell you any more than that. Um, but I I do hope so. I do hope so. If if and when you're next in the Black Library, will you talk to us again? Yes. Yay. I would love to read some more. Um, and I'm now going to go through and 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 search out the other Anna Stevens titles in the Black Library. Um, I'm also, uh, we will put a link below to uh, anything else you wish to plug. Um, uh, what, what, is there any anything else uh, uh, and 
a fan of Gothical Hollow should uh, follow up on, and uh, <laughs> even outside Warhammer. I know, shock. I well, oh. um, brace, brace yourselves, viewer. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but also, we should say quickly, I'm hoping to talk to Anna in a month or so about all the, the different things because Anna is a proper writer. Proper writer. Uh, you know, and so I'm excited to talk to her about everything you're about to hear. So hopefully, Anna and I will be talking on my channel about all these books and fantasy realms. So, yeah, you do the whole list, do the shebang. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Gulf Call Hollow is currently my first and only horror novel um but i did have so much fun writing it that um i would like to try my hand at horror again um but for now um i am firmly within the realms of fantasy uh so my debut trilogy is the goblin trilogy um which is that they're, they're all out the third book came out in 2019 uh, my current trilogy is called Songs of the Drowned. Um, the first two are out, which is The Stone Knife and The Jaguar Path. And mm -hmm. the third book, which is called The Dark Feather, is out in at 28th of March next year. I also write tie-in fiction for Marvel Comics. Oh, wow. Um, so I write, I write prose novels based on the comic characters rather than the cinematic universe characters. Uh, so I've got two books out with them, both of which feature um, Brunhilde the Valkyrie and Lady Sif, um, nice. getting up to all sorts of hijinks <laughs> um, and fighting a lot of bad guys. And um, the most recent one is called Queen of Deception and also features Hela um, when the three of them get trapped in Tudor, England. Oh, that sounds epic. It is. It, I had so much fun writing that <laughs> one. And there oh. is, there is, um, uh, Hella ends up recruiting the services of a sort of 16 year old boy um, called William, who may, oh. may not. <laughs> Say no more. No there, holds there is, there is a certain poet and playwright who <laughs> also always credited the Dark Lady as his muse. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. We will put links to all of those below. Um, thank you. And yeah, we look forward to reading more. Thanks so much for coming on and chatting to us. Thank you for having me. It's it's been it's been brilliant to actually talk about Goth Call Hollow for an hour. Um, so because <laughs> I do I do I love the book um, and I'm proud of it. So thank you for inviting me on. Well, we love Yay. it too. And um, yeah, we'll uh, see you. We'll see you next time. Okay. Brilliant. See you Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys.